Welcome. Glad you could join us. I'm Doug Skinner, your host today for the Fireside Chat on the Go-To-Market Strategy. Uh, we're looking at things like closing gaps for companies, founders, startup folks, business people, product management folks that want to invent, that place a high value on innovation and product development. And today I'm very pleased to be bringing you Deepak. Uh, I think uh, I think you'll be pleased too. He's got lots of experience in the B2B software as a service space. Uh, 14 years in that, eight years scaling up companies that like uh, Sugar CRM and Bright Edge. Uh, more recently with iCharts, and he is a mentor and a coach at Berkeley Skydeck and other uh, incubation uh, places. And so he's also he, he, the foundation was Big Five Consulting many years in that. And uh, so really pleased to have you with us today, Deepak. Dio Lalikar. Yes. Um, <laughs> Thank you. <Dad. laughs> uh, thanks for coming. And so, uh, please, okay. take the torch. So, thank you, Doug. Uh, my name is Deepak Dio Lalikar. If you just follow the vowels, it just makes it a little bit easier. My topic for today's discussion is starting up. So you have this idea and you want to get started with a startup what are the very first steps uh, that you think about? And I'm not going to be talking about incorporating your company or legal. I'm going to be talking more from a product, from a customer-centric point of view. How do you, what are the first steps? Ideally, you should be doing some of these steps even before you, you know, think about starting your startup just to validate some of the ideas in here. And this is something I've learned in my own my, the startup that I was in, iChart. And over the years, I have advised many startups as part of the Berkeley Skydeck network as well. And that's a topic that I'm going to be uh, talking about today. So the basic idea is you want to do a startup. That is cool. That is great. Maybe you have this very cool AI ML idea in, in the tech space. And you want to help others. Uh, you want to say, hey, I have this cool idea and I really want to help others. You probably have even built a prototype or a minimum viable product, which is MVP. But now what? How do you proceed from here? So I'm going to talk a little bit about the first steps, like step number zero. Uh, we'll start over there. So before I do that, it's very important to understand why do startups fail? There are a billion reasons why startups fail. You probably heard of all the good startups that made it big, like Loom that just got acquired by Atlassian, Figma got acquired by Adobe. You only hear the great stories, but believe me, they are less than 2% of all the startups that start. There are 98 other 98% uh, startups that never make it. They never make money. And why does that happen? Now, the most common reasons are Number one, they have built something, but the customer don't actually have a need for that. Now think about, you know, when you go to a, a store, like a Home Depot, there are so many products out there. Do you buy everything? No, you only buy things that are utmost priority or important for you. So one of the big reasons startups fail is that the customers don't actually have a need. Uh, and it's not a big problem for them. Now, this is, this is especially true in business software. They have a lot of problems. They, are not, they don't have one problem. They have 100 problems. But only two or three of those problems are big enough that need to be solved with some solution. Rest of the other, uh, you know what? We can live with it. We, we can manage. It's like, you know, when you are like a, in a home, you're, you have a small crack in, in a window. You can live with it. And you know, if your situation doesn't allow you to spend a little bit more money, you'll probably say, you know what, I'll get to it later. I can live with that crack. It's the same principle customer apply, apply as well. They will spend money on solutions if they have a big problem that will help them. Now, the third reason startups fail is, well, there is a need by a customer. It's a big problem, but the product actually does not solve the problem. Now, this is going to be especially important with all this AI-related startups. And if you have an AI problem, AI is still very early in its you know, early stages uh, of uh, deployment into the business world. 
And what if you build this AI solution and the prediction or the output is not very accurate? The customers are not going to like that, right? So your product has to actually solve the problem significantly. The fourth reason is, well, the product solves the problem, but it's very hard to use. It's too cumbersome. The UI is not great. It takes a long time. Uh, so those are some reasons. And finally, another important reason is it's very difficult to sell or market. What I mean by that is uh, you can hire the best salespeople and the best marketing team to help you sell your product. But if your product is not positioned properly, if you do not have the right value proposition to the customer, and if you can't even identify who your customers are, it's going to be extremely difficult to sell or market whoever you hire. So those are the main, main reasons. So what's the solution for this? So the, the big idea here is that before we jump into a startup, we test. We test if there is a need, if this is a big enough problem, and so on and so forth. And that's what this step zero is all about. So if you follow a structured and proven method, it will help you to de-risk and improve your chances of success. Remember, uh, num number one reason startups fail, customers don't have a need. So if they don't have a need, why are you building something? Don't build anything that the customers actually don't need. Build something that the customers actually do need. And so, so what is the framework like? So there are four steps in this process. Number one, validate the problem. Find out if the customers actually have this problem or not, or is it just in your head? Uh, talk to customers, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Once you have identified the problem, now you validate whether the product that you have actually built actually works or not. Now, it has to work. Uh, there is no point of, hey, I, I have a problem X, and I got this product, but it's too cumbersome. I, I don't know how to use it. Lots of training. No, it, you need to validate how, how to make it easy for users to use your product, right? Now, we have validated the product. Now you say validate sellability. What do I mean by sellability? What I mean by sellability is that the product is ready to be sold. It has, a, it has the right price point. You know who to sell to. You know how to market it. You know what the packaging will look like. And it is very easy to sell. Now, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about some examples of how you understand uh, sellability uh, in, in the later slide. And then finally, the most important step will be, at some point in the future, validate repeatability. So what is a startup, by the way? A startup, according to Steve Blank, who was one of my professors at uh, MBA, he said a startup is a temporary organization in search of a repeatable sales process. Think about that. It's a temporary organization. So all of this that you are doing here is, is a temporary step. What you are trying to get to really is repeatability. Now, a test for repeatability is, let's say you are a founder and you have this great idea, you are able to talk about it, and you can sell it. But can you sell to 100 customers? No, you don't have the bandwidth, you don't have the time. So you hire a salesperson or maybe a junior rep to help you sell. Can they do it? Can they do it with the same passion and energy as you? And if the answer is yes, then yes, you have validated that I can hire a salesperson or a marketing person to help me grow uh, because I have reached a stage where I have understood the problem, I know the product works, I know what sells, and now I can make, make anybody sell it. This is your end goal in the first four stages. Of, this is called the zero to one journey. It has four steps uh, involved in that. How long does this take? There is no right answer or wrong answer on this one. Uh, it could take six months. It could take three years. I have known startups that take five years just to reach this stage. I have known startups that can be as quick as six months. It all depends upon your audience, your type of product that you're making, uh, and so on. So let's dig a little bit deeper into each one of these. So step number one is validate the problem. So is there even a pain point? And uh, you are building this you know, fancy AI algorithm to predict something, and you go to a customer and they say, eh, you know what, it's okay, I can live with it. Is it even a serious pain? Is it big enough? Uh, is it faced by a few people or many people? So, you know, it, it's like, you know, when you talk to friends and a, a few of your friends have a problem, but not all of them have the same problem, right? 
But if all of them have a similar problem, maybe there is a need for a solution in there. If it is only a few people have that specific problem, maybe it's not worth uh, investing a product in there. And finally, is the pain point solvable? Not everything is solvable. World peace is not solvable. Uh, wars are not solvable. Likewise, not all uh, problem areas are solvable. Customers live with it. So you have to understand, how do you do this? You talk to 20 customers, at least, or maybe 50, depending upon what type of product you are making, and you find patterns. So let's say I talk to 20 customers, and 10 of them say, wow, I actually have this problem, and this is something I really want to solve for, and I'm willing to pay money for it, uh, and I want a solution that does something like this. It is worth my time to invest uh, in such a solution. If at least half of them say that, then yes, you have a problem big enough that warrants a product. And now you can proceed to the next step in that. If two people say out of 20 that, hey, eh, it's not a, yeah, it's a big point, but 18 of them say, nah, you know what, we can live with it. I'll give you a story. A friend of mine, many years ago, uh, he, he uh, had an idea about a fintech platform or, or a solution. So they talked to a few of their friends on Wall Street, and all of them said, yeah, this is a good idea. So they spent 18 months building the product. After 18 months, they went back to their friends and said, hey, product is ready, buy it. I said, oh, no, no, no. Oh, we already have our Bloomberg terminals. We don't need another product. So they didn't ask that question. They only asked, how is it? That's the wrong question to ask. How is my idea? Maybe your mom might say it's a great idea. It's a great question for her just uh, to make you feel good. But when you talk to prospects and customers, you have to dig deeper. So don't ask them uh, if they will buy your product. That's a wrong question. Ask them, what are your pain points today? How are you solving it today? What have you tried? How serious is the pain point? Is it big enough? And do all, all of them say the same thing? And is it solvable? So that's the first step that you actually have to do this. Now, imagine you are you are working somewhere, maybe you are a student, you're finishing up your graduation, and you have this great idea. Don't start building your product yet. Start with this step. Talk to potential users of your future product and ask them. Uh, I'll give you another example. Dropbox is a very popular uh, file sharing system. Everybody is aware of that. Did you know they did not even have a product? They did not have a single line of code. And by the time, they, all they did was they created a video and they shared it on social and LinkedIn. They got 20,000 signups. People were eager to have that pain point solved. Once they got 20,000 signups, that's when they said, uh, okay, let's build a product. Now, do you need 20,000 signups? No, that was just their example. But you need enough to say that, you know what? And it also gives you conviction that, yes, this is a big enough pain point. I want to, I want to build something in there. Uh, so, so the key principle here is build a product that solves a real customer pain point. Don't just build it because you studied in school some AI ML topic and you have this idea in your lab or you just had it in your head. No, talk to customers. So if you want to take away one thing out of this presentation, talk to potential customers and users, as many as you can. Document everything that they said write it down in your Notion or Coda or whatever you use and uh, find patterns from that point onwards. So that is the, the, the most significant message I want to, uh, you to take away from this presentation today. Also remember, customers pay for painkillers, not vitamins. So if I, if I tell you that you, know, you have a broken arm and you're, you have a fracture, you need to go to the doctor and get a, get a cast or something, and now it's you are in pain, would you pay anything to uh, for that painkiller? Absolutely. But if I tell you, hey, you might take some vitamin D and maybe in six months you'll have less pain, you'll probably think, you know what, I'll worry about it later. So think about that. Customers will always pay for painkillers, not vitamins. So the other thing that I want to make sure that whenever you start something, always start in a niche segment. So let's imagine you have this AI idea that helps salespeople, whatever that may be. It helps better prediction of sales opportunities as they are talking to customers, right? So you started with salespeople. 
there are like i don't know 5 million sales people just in the united states are you going to build something for everyone no you will not do that so maybe you niche it down so one if one uh, method is you start drilling down by technology or function this is one example your example could be different sales people but within technology but that is still too broad there might probably be a million sales people just in technology so maybe i will focus just on b2b software what is it about b2b software well it's a saas business they churn there's a lot of recurring revenue so my solution will be a better fit for that fine so that means from here this sales person could include a person from uh, metlife who's selling life insurance but this person is just selling say uh, docusign or oracle or 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 netsuite right you can even further go down there are different types of sales people there are sdrs account managers sales operation there are different roles within sales organization so you can say i am going to build a software specifically for account managers who are selling b2b software in the technology space start there once you have solved for this persona then you can expand to other types of sales right but always 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 start extremely niche in one segment questions yeah you Comments? get rich you, you get rich in the niche and <laughs> that's a good place to start <laughs> <laughs> yes start in a niche uh how do you pick a niche segment um there are various ways so when i was at i charts one of the first uh, thing that we encountered was who is our customer who do i sell this to it was the data visualization software basically you upload an excel file and it will create a chart for you you can do that in excel yes but you can't make it interactive you can't put it on the web that can be shared like a youtube video so that's what our uh, uh, value proposition was but who do i sell this to and i spoke to 80 different prospects in a span of like 4 months uh, i used to read the wall street journal and i i i would look at charts in there and note down the source and let's say there was a chart about you know gdp of blah 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 and the source was you know national bureau of economic research so i would note that down so so like that i spoke to like 80 different prospects then i started segmenting them into different categories of uh, segments and and the key thing that i did was uh, in each segment i asked the question is there a significant pain point do they actually want to solve this problem remember i said not all customer problems are worth sol- solving for they don't have the bandwidth they don't care they are happy with their manual processes right but do they actually have the motivation to solve this pain point how prevalent is the pain is it for a few customers or is it for a large customer are they easy to target uh, what i mean by that is so let's say i build a solution for business analyst well business analyst is too broad right it's very hard what will you how will you put up ads hey, all business analysts there are so many different types of business analyst but if you narrow so i am solving a problem for business analyst in sales operation teams who are creating uh, sales reports and performance reports okay that's very very specific you can target them you can you actually know who to target so uh, what i did was i took all these different segments market research was one of my segments publications was another of my segment bloggers was another of my segment now there is another uh, column that you will add later do they will they pay do they have now this is the, it's a proxy for do they want to solve this problem is there a significant pain point you would imagine that if they have a significant pain point and they want to solve it they'll be willing to pay but i think we need another column later on to say do they actually pay or not there is no point in solving a problem or building a product for one segment and they will have no willingness to pay so i'll give you an example uh, i spoke to many associations there are 16000 associations in the united states alone uh, i don't know the number worldwide but let's say like american diabetes association american hospital association and they have a lot of data and i thought they'll be a good customer segment for us to go into i will take their data and visualize it in fancy charts so that they can uh, put it on the website that allows them to share it the problem is uh, they have the pain they want to solve this it's a big pain uh, they are easy to target too but they have no willingness to pay because it's just the way their budgets work. 
So not every customer uh, is willing to pay you. So we'll get to that in, in a little bit. Okay, now, now let's move on. Did I miss something? Okay. Now let's move on to the second step. So you have identified, you've talked to 20 customers, you have found some pattern that these types of customers have this kind of a problem and they meet those four criteria that I showed in the previous slide. Now you build something, maybe an MVP uh, or just bare minimum. You can even make a video or, or, a, or a mock or, or something. But if you are building something in AI or ML, you actually want to do it, show them something. So let's say you are building an AI product that shows some uh, prediction on sales. Show them first that this is how it shows and this is the accuracy of that. You want to make sure that the product actually works. So does the product solve the key pain point? Is it easy to build? Now, you may, you may have a product idea. It solves the problem, but it is very difficult to build because you need lots of data. It's expensive. So you want to make sure that it is easy. Uh, you want to make sure that there are no friction points. What I mean by that, when you give the product to your customer, they don't feel uh, friction in their usage. It's as easy. So how many of you, raise your hand if you have uh, bought an iPhone and you opened a manual for an iPhone? Zero. Nobody has a manual for iPhone. That means using an iPhone has zero friction. You buy, you start using it. You have to make your product as simple as buying an iPhone. And is it too much hassle building upon that? So let's, in, when you build software for enterprises, there's a lot of uh, moving parts. You have to import the data, you have to migrate data, you have to set up your users, you have to take backups. It's a lot of work, but you, and there is no escaping that. You have to do that, but make it as simple as possible. Uh, very recently, I had built a new product and uh, in that product, uh, the customer was required to integrate their Microsoft Outlook. And it so happened that this particular customer had a very weird Outlook setup. They were in on-premise, they were not using Office 365. It took me four meetings to figure out how to connect to their Outlook before they can even start using my part of the product, which is what I was trying to sell them. Finally, they said, you know what, this is too much of a hassle, let's revisit this at some other time. And I lost that customer. So this is something I have to keep thinking that if it is to, to, by the way, what did I do in this case? I told my salespeople that in future, we will not solve for, we will not sell to customers who have Microsoft on-prem version because it's not worth our time. It's too much of a hassle for them. Once they move to Office 365, we have a solution for that. So that's just an example. You have to make it as much hassle-free and make it as iPhone-like experience as possible. Now, so, so your action item here is make a list of bare minimum features that provide significant value. Now, you, you probably have heard the term MVP, not the most valuable player in football, but minimum viable product. What that means is it's the smallest amount of functionality or uh, proof of a product that you show to a customer who will say, yep, I want this. And I'll give you an example. Everyone is familiar with Zappos where you buy shoes, you know what the minimum viable product was? Uh, Tony Shea, who was the founder of Zappos, he would go to the stores like Macy's or DSW, he would take pictures of shoes on his camera, come back to his house, upload the pictures on his website with the right price tag and put it up and put it on social, hey, buy shoes here. What was he testing? Was he testing the supply chain issues? No. Nope. Was he testing packaging? No. Nope. He was only testing, are there people willing to buy shoes online? Because nobody was doing that at that time. This is, I'm talking about late 90s, 1997, 1998. Nobody was buying shoes online. They were buying books, but they were not buying shoes online. What was the biggest learning he got out of that? The biggest learning he got, people are willing to buy shoes online as long as you make it easy for them to return if the size doesn't fit. So he built free returns into that. That was the MVP. Once he figured out that people are willing to uh, uh, buy shoes online, then he built his website, he worked with suppliers, he had an inventory, supply chain, all of that came much later. But because that's the easy part. I, I, I should say that's a straightforward part. It's not easy, but it's a straightforward part. What's hard is to determine if is anybody going to buy shoes online. 
So that's the second step. Does the product work? Is it easy? No friction or is it too much hassle? And how can we make it hassle free? But that's the goal in step two. And then you have to go into the next step. Now you build your product, even if it is a bare minimum frugal product, you still have to sell it, right? Uh, even though your initial customers who you interviewed in the first step might, you, you'll probably go back to those 20 customers again. And half of them might say, yeah, you know what, we'll buy. But the other half might say, eh, not, not today, maybe next week, next quarter, next week, next month. Uh, so you have to still sell it. Selling never stops. So one thing, uh, another thing to take away from here uh, in this presentation, once you do get into the startup mode, you are always selling. You are selling to customers, you are selling to investors, you are selling future employees to join your company and take a bet on you. So you are always selling your idea, your vision. But specifically in this step, will customers buy or can they live with some pain? Uh, do the customer understand? and the value proposition. You also have to know who, who is the buyer, who is the influencer, who is the beneficiary. It, let's say you build some AI product like a smart watch for teenagers or kids. Uh, are they the buyers? No, the parents are the buyers. So you have to actually convince the buyers that this watch is going to help uh, homework for your, for your teenager. Uh, so, so you have to understand who is the buyer, who is the influencer, who is the beneficiary. What are the hurdles in the purchase process? Remember that iPhone thing? It's so easy to buy an iPhone, right? Any product that you see is very easy to uh, find. And then what is the right price point? Now this is this bullet point, the last bullet point is a topic by itself. I'm not the best expert on this, but you have to figure out uh, the right price point through various mechanisms. There are tons of books and uh, YouTube videos you can find on that one, but you have to experiment with that as well. Um, so. So this is how you validate the sellability. And the idea here is, oh, and the other thing is that you are not hiring a salesperson just yet. You may think that you have created this product and now you just hire a salesperson and help tell him to, hey, go and sell. No, that's not going to work. You have to sell. You may have a computer science degree. You may have a, a mechanical engineering degree. You are an engineer. I get it. You are selling. In the first 20 sales of the first 20 buyers, you are selling. Why? Because you are understanding what resonates with the customer. What is the value proposition that I should talk about? Because if you hire a salesperson, what are they going to talk about? They don't have a script in place yet. Uh, they don't know how to position your product yet. You are the expert, not them. So you do not hire any salesperson unless you have gone through this step yourself. And I had never been done sales ever in my life. So when I started in, in that startup, I actually was doing sales. I was actually closing deals. I was getting people to sign contracts. Is it easy? <laughs> no. Is it hard? Yes. But you have to get through that. But don't think of it as selling. Uh, think of it that you are solving a problem for someone. You are good at that, right? You have this product. You know the problem. You are just explaining to them, hey, Mr. Customer, customers like you have this problem. We think you can benefit. Uh, let me show you what do you think. Just if you keep that attitude in mind, then it's not selling, it's problem solving. Okay. But what you learn out of that is what resonates because this output of this thing is going to be extremely important for the next step, which is validate repeatability. Is the value proposition clear enough that any salesperson can sell? The true test of repeatability is that you can hire any salesperson from any company and ask them to start selling and they know exactly what the script looks like, what the talking points look like, how to give a demo, which features to highlight, which features not to highlight, or, or at least not yet. Basically, you're building a formula. Once you have built a formula, now you can test the formula and refine that sales process so that you are going to hire new salespeople. As you hire new salespeople, they need time to ramp up uh, to, to that uh, idea, right? <clears throat> and it should be very quick. They should be able to sell within two weeks or a month maybe. So that's the last step in this whole process. So, so the key idea here is that uh, you de-risk the startup. Okay. So, so the main thing that I wanted to uh, mention here in this presentation is don't just start something and build a product. Talk to people, validate the problem, make sure the product works, 
validate that it can be sold, the value proposition is clear, the customer profile is clear, and then you find out whether you can repeatedly sell it or not. Once you know who to target, <coughs> who uh, and you know their pain point, and you know how to position to them, you know how to sell to them, only then you think about scaling and building your company. And that is the end of my presentation. Uh, I'm open for questions. You can follow me. I write every day on LinkedIn and Twitter and X. Uh, you can also subscribe to my weekly newsletter where I share uh, topics about B2B product management and startups. Uh, you can take a scan of this uh, QR code. Uh, back to you, Doug. That's awesome. Thank you very much. And it's very clear that you've touched on the main four elements that are involved. I like best what stands out for me as one of the hurdles. Uh, the customers pay for painkillers, not vitamins. Uh, that, that is such a, a, a rich area where I think uh, some people, you know, they stumble to get over that hurdle. How, how would you characterize the biggest, the biggest hurdle with respect to, you know, going through the validation steps? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, so during your discovery process, which is like the first step, uh, you are interviewing potential users on their jobs. Like you are asking them, what do you do on a daily basis? So let's say you are building some solution for salespeople. Talk to a salesperson, ask them, what is your job? What do you do? What does success look like? What does perfect look like to you? Uh, what are some hassles that you have in your day-to-day -day job? Don't talk about your product. Don't talk about your idea. Only talk about their jobs. There is this framework that uh, I teach here at the Berkeley as well uh, called Jobs to be Done Framework, JTDD to, in short. Jobs to be Done Framework tells uh, how a user works on their day-to-day -day basis. Every user, whether it's an uh, accountant or salesperson or, I don't know, channel partner manager, they all have their jobs, right? And you have to build solutions for them to make their job easier. So what are those jobs? So you have to get into that psyche of that user and learn what their jobs are. And then you start identifying the key pain point and then ask, you know, how big of a pain point is it? How do you know how big of a pain point is it? Ask them when did they encounter this pain point last? Was it yesterday or six months ago? How often does it happen? Does it happen every day or uh, does it happen? Let's take an example. Uh, I, uh, I was talking to one sales operations person. Oh, I take the Salesforce report and then I put it into Excel, and then I take the commission structure data, then I have to marry that data together, and then I have to do some calculation, and there's a lot of mistakes. Okay, so how often do you do that? Well, we pay our commissions every month, so at least once a month we have this problem. Well, that's an interesting problem. How long does it take? Well, it takes anywhere from two days to a week. So what's the impact of that? Well, we pay commissions late. So what happens then? Well, the salespeople get demoralized that their commissions are getting late. So if you if you want to pay commissions on time, you have to produce the reports on time, which means you have to have less number of manual steps. This is, seems to be like a significant pain point for me. So so that's how you identify how, how if it is a painkiller or a vitamin. Right. You know, the other thing that many salespeople would want to do is to, to actually inflame the pain uh, an example would be like what in the case where the accounting staff was calculating the commissions on a monthly basis, the time it takes one or two days might be more costly that they cannot do a some FP&A planning, right? Some some financial planning or strategic analysis or tax preparation or uh, consulting with auditors or other things that accounting fa uh, and finance folks do. Uh, so there, there, there is a, there is a dynamic there that that goes beyond just the, the you know the, the first level uh, of pain, and uh, of course that's my wheelhouse: sales enablement, yeah. 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 going that's a great into, example. Yeah. In, into the sales piece. But but um, I, I just we're we're running short on time, so I want to I want to wrap this up, and I do want to say again, thank you. It's really awesome to have my you. Pleasure. Uh, and, and to, to see this this uh, very very concise and valuable uh, outline for for the validation steps and product development, and, um, and I would hope that for everyone that sees this and wants to develop a product, 
that they are working on painkillers, not vitamins. <laughs> <laughs> well said. Thank you so much for uh, inviting me. Yes. And thanks for coming. Uh, really great to have you.